Thank you so much, Catherine. Give us a moment here as we arrange ourselves on the stage. We're going to have um, two folks up with here, up with us here in the room, and then um, we're going to have one more joining us virtually as well. Thank you so much. All righty, come on up, folks. I am really looking forward to this conversation. There you are, Ana Catalina. You guys can take a seat. Yeah, and we, we'll need the mics. Thank you. No, yeah, I want to be able to see all of you. All righty, thank you so much to all of you for being here. I'm really excited about this one. This conversation is about food waste and before I even introduce you all, I want a show of hands in the room. Raise your hand if you have ever found and thrown out a really sketchy head of lettuce in your fridge. Yes, popular problem, right? We've all bought things at the grocery store that we really had our best intentions of using and eating and then, ooh, takeout just looked so good or we got home really late and we didn't end up using it and we threw it away. And that's what we're gonna be talking about here today. Um, it's a massive issue. We're gonna get into some of the specifics of that as well as things that we can all be doing to be reducing the worst of it. So I'm so pleased to be joined by our panel today. I've got with us Ana Catalina Suarez Pena, who's the Senior Director of Strategy and Innovation at the Global Food Banking Network. And then we've got Pete Pearson, the Senior Director of Food Loss and Waste at the World Wildlife Fund. And joining us virtually, we also have uh, David Catt, who's the Senior Vice President of Business Development at Wasteless. David, can you hear us all right? Yeah, all right, perfectly spectacular, well, thanks. great. Um, so food waste is something that we all have been a part of, right, unfortunately. Pete, I wanna come to you first. Tell us the stakes, how bad really is this problem? Uh, I mean, when you look at it, I think the more we measure this problem, the worse it gets, unfortunately. Uh, it's largely a problem that is unmeasured globally. Um, we use a lot of estimates of estimates. Some of it's really old data, to be honest. And we did a revamp of, of some of the best measurements we have in something we call our Driven to Waste Report. We published this in 2021. And we found that the original estimate of 33% or the one third of all food is probably closer to 40% when you more accurately take into account the post-harvest loss and the waste that's happening on farms. Oh, so, wow. That's depressing. <clears throat> yeah. And so what you didn't ask, though, up front is how many people have eaten that sketchy head of lettuce in yeah. the fridge. <laughs> and that's true. That's important. <laughs> and I actually appreciate that because I am notorious among my friends for eating something that, like, maybe we shouldn't be eating. But I am just so opposed to throwing it away and want to find a way to use things that... Um, you know, maybe I perhaps shouldn't be eating, but we can talk more about that. Yeah. <laughs> but, but I think an issue is, is largely that uh, we've, w when you don't see something, it's largely a conditioning that we all have that we don't see waste, but, and waste is a human construct. The more you really start to see it and the more you start to measure it, the worse that it probably is. But that's just a product of having to deal with it. Like, We've got to start seeing it. We've got to start really accounting for it and turning it not into waste, but as a realization that we have nutrients, that we have food that needs to be circular and we can use all of this. It's never, it never should be waste. Yeah, thanks so much for that. And Ana Catalina, I'd like to come to you next. Um, tell us about how through the Global Food Banking Network, food banks can be a part of the solution. Thank you, and thank you for the invitation and to all the speakers because it has been an amazing day. I have been taking notes a lot and sending to the team in Latin America with new ideas because this, so the solution is, comes together. It's a, it's, a, it's a bunch of many actions made for many people in all the supply chain. And the first one that I want to say is um, since 2015, the numbers around poverty and extreme, po extreme poverty and hunger has been increasing. It's not a circumstances that was after the pandemic situation. And that is important, it's huge, and it's huge because we have many, res nowadays we, we are responsible about the numbers and what is happening in this moment. We are facing something that we are calling the food access crisis. That means we have food, 
the numbers that was Pete was mentioning, but at the same time we have the number of people that is facing malnutrition, that is facing hunger, is increasing across the globe. And the numbers related to deficiency, for example, about fruit and vegetables, is huge. But at the same time, 40% in the global south, in the low, low and medium income countries, uh, of the food that we are wasting or losing is fruit and vegetables at the same time. Then the problem is huge. Since, to that, since 1967, food banks exist as an NGO trying to help to reduce recovering food, that the food that couldn't sell, recovering that food and redistributing that food to people in need. Um, but guess what? Guess what? In this moment, we are just recovering 1% of the total amount of the 2 billion. Oh, wow. That's really low. Yes. It's almost nothing. But at the same time, we are serving almost 40 million people across the globe in 50 countries. And I love the last panel because everything that we are doing is led by the communities. We are serving every month 56,000 NGOs, based NGOs, that they are solving the problem. A problem that is a public problem. And I want to do a difference between public services and the role of the public sector with the public, what the public problems means. Because when we are talking about poverty, when we are talking about hunger, extreme poverty, that is, we are talking about public problems. Means everyone in the society is in charge to provide solutions and to be part of the solutions that we are facing. I love that. I think that's a great call to action because I think a lot of times these problems feel really overwhelming. So um, we're going to talk um, next. Um, David, I'm going to come to you about a particular solution um, that you've helped develop to reduce food loss and waste, which gives people a really concrete way to be a part of a solution for this. So tell us a little bit about Wasteless and what you all do. Yeah, thanks very much. Um, hope you can all uh, hear me well. Calling from uh, Amsterdam, it's uh, night out already. Um, and uh, hearing the, the previous panel, um, it's, it's, it becomes ever more clear that that the the food system is extremely long, extremely difficult, uh, uh, and has a lot of different problems. And some of the problems in some uh, parts of the chain actually exacerbate the others. Uh, what we at Wasteless do is we incentivize consumers, mostly actually in the global north, to buy a product with slightly less shelf life at a slightly lower price. So we, we have a uh, uh, artificial intelligence and we measure, we gauge the, the, the risk that a certain item will perish on the shelf. And we then find the, the freshness sensitivity. So you're talking about your wilted lettuce. So just before it wilts, a couple of days before, when it's still perfectly fresh, we actually incentivize you to buy it uh, with slightly less shelf life and at a slightly lower price. And uh, here, the previous panel and also uh, and also this panel, it becomes really clear that in the global north, we really have a responsibility to uh, reduce food waste. Uh, and to because it, if, if we do that well, and if we do that responsibly, uh, we will actually uh, be able to reduce food prices uh, along the chain and also make sure... Oh, I'm gone. Yeah, there I am again. Uh, so to, to reduce it. food prices... Yeah, so to reduce food prices along the chain and make sure that producers get fairer prices because that's 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 a, a massive problem in, in, in the food system as well. There is enough, and Pete will probably uh, go into it in a bit as well, there is more than enough food to feed... Uh, uh, the, the, the global population, it's just at the wrong place, at the wrong time. And we want to incentivize people in the global north to waste less uh, and to make sure that there, there's more uh, money and more uh, to, to actually uh, distribute it fairer uh, because no one should, uh, should go to bed uh, hungry. I think Thank that you. point bears repeating that there is enough food today on the planet to feed every human being alive. Um, yet, as we heard from the last panel, children are still starving to death, and this absolutely should not be happening. So, David, really great to hear about a technological solution that you have come up with um, that obviously is applicable in certain contexts. But we also have food, you know, 
being wasted and lost in other parts of the supply chain. Pete, I want to talk to you a little bit about the difference, actually, between food loss and food waste. So we've talked a little bit about food in our own fridges that we throw out that we don't eat or those leftovers that go bad, and then food that also expires on a grocery store shelf. But talk to us a little bit about the supply chain before food even reaches the grocery store and how much we are losing in that part of the chain. I mean, the the estimates up until retail vary between like 15% to 25% of that total loss figure is probably happening post-harvest and as things move through supply chain. Um, again, that, the driven to waste report that we did a, uh, a year and a half ago, it really goes into a lot of detail looking at the loss and the waste that happens before retail. But I think it's important that these are all based on decisions and, and through frameworks that we can change. Like we can start to look at this differently. We need to look at this as nutrient flows, right? From beginning to end, we are dealing with a nutrient flow, an energy system essentially. And at each point in that energy system, we're comfortable and we don't even care about loss in those stages. Um, the Ellen MacArthur Foundation has done some really amazing work around circular food economy. And I'd really, if, if you're interested in this topic, take a look at it. Uh, their estimates show that globally, we take organic material and only 12% of global organic material makes it out of landfills. That means the other, right, 88% of organic material is going into landfills. Here's the big one though. 2%, less than 2% of nutrients globally are recycled in our food system. Like the, these numbers that you just look at this and you say that this is, this is not how you manage a planet with finite resources. Uh, we can't just keep expanding, expanding because there's not many more planets left, right? That we have what we have. And so we've got to fundamentally think about nutrient flows differently. And that's going to serve people well, ultimately. We, we, we do this in the name of humanity and, and, and serving people, and it's a fundamental change in how we think about the system as a linear system. Mm -hmm. Ana Catalina, I'd love to come to you on that nutrition piece. I can tell you've already got something to say. Yeah. Thank you. Just imagine nowadays with the 1% that we are recovering and redistributing across the globe, for example, in Latin America, with the amount of food that we are distributing that is recovery food, that means we are not purchasing. We are purchasing in some countries, but the amount of food is no more than 10%. And 90% is recovered food, food that we rescue from the total supply chain, from the agriculture farmers, from the agriculture, sorry, for, from the industry, industry manufacturing, from the retailers. We are providing, just an idea, a lunch school program provide more or less 30% of the nutrients that a person needs in a day, that children needs in a day, 30%. Food banks in Latin America, with the amount of food that we are recovering, are providing 13% of the amount that a person needs during the day with recovered food. We are talking about nutrients. We are talking about hunger. We are talking about poverty. It's not possible to talk about this planet is not possible to talk about future if we don't resolve poverty, extreme poverty and hunger, because if we see all the papers that we have nowadays, how poverty is pressuring the environment um, to survive is huge. Then if we don't resolve the point about poverty, extreme poverty and hunger, it's not possible to talk about environment. Yeah, I think that's a, a really I, important I, point. Oop. Go ahead, David. Yeah, no, because I, I heard the word environment and it's, it's, it didn't come up uh, yet. The metric we've been talking about up till now is mostly uh, nutrition. It's, 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 it's feeding the world. But actually, food waste is causing 9% of greenhouse gas emissions. So it's not just that we're not eating it, we're actually, by not eating it, we're actually destroying our future. We're destroying uh, biodiversity. Uh, we're causing global uh, global warming, um, and a metric that 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 that, that I'm always puzzled about is that the, the total economic value of the food system is ten trillion dollars. The as forty percent of it is wasted, actually uh, the, the 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 food waste is causing a is harming the planet to the tune of more than four trillion dollars, and that's really 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 painful. Because not only are we 
wasting the food, we're actually eating up uh, the future and the future of our kids. So that's really what we want to do at, at Wasteless is to incentivize children and incentivize families to save their wallet and save the planet. And those really go hand, uh, go, go really go hand in hand, especially if you then able redistribution to food banks, et cetera, as well. The food recovery hierarchy is very, very uh, precise about it. First prevent, and then the diversion, et cetera, they're, they're, uh, they're, they're, they're second and third priorities. And David, how do you go about incentivizing customers? Because um, I think, you know, sometimes people sort of realize what a problem this is, but a lot of people really have no idea the problem, um, the scale, the impact, how it's adversely affecting our food system and our planet. Tell us a little bit about how you connect with consumers and make people care about this. Yeah. So a your your local supermarket is uh, probably throwing out food to the tune of uh, half a million uh, dollars a year or more. And what we do is we when you go into your supermarket, you get the choice of buying a product with slightly less shelf life uh, at a at a at a slightly lower price point. What we want to do, obviously, is we want to plow that money back into uh, into the food system. So what I would really love to do is to give the most loyal customers of a supermarket bonus points or WWF points or food bank points, because when you are saving food and your kids are driving you to save that food, you're also actually helping someone else uh, get, uh, get, get food on the table. Pete? What about so, so for us? So 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 we're actually so all we are doing is we have uh, we know the freshness sensitivity. So we know the likelihood of a consumer to go, forego a little bit of freshness for a slightly lower price, and that's a driver, and that's a very important driver uh, to actually in the connection between food, uh, uh, the consumer, and the supermarket. Yeah, I think that cost element is huge, particularly, I mean, it's an issue all around the world, but we've been hearing here in the United States how high grocery prices are right now. Everyone's talking about eggs and how expensive those are. So anything that can be done to lower those prices a little bit for consumers. Um, Pete, what about on the policy side? Um, how do you incentivize uh, people who can control some of these systems to care about this? Uh, good question, because it's like it has me perplexed a lot. I mean, this is 20% um, of governments globally have committed to food loss and waste as part of their climate indices. That number is completely lacking. We need we need more than 80% of governments uh, committing to this as a climate issue. Um, I I was really p pleased to see, and I think the conservation community in general, uh, the the outcome from COP15, the biodiversity COP that happened in Canada this year. Um, I think there's some real progress being made in high ambition countries that are taking on this idea of let's save nature, let's save space for nature on this planet. 30% um, by 30 by 30 campaign. Um, when you do that, you start to create the real limits that we, that we see within agriculture expansion, right? We've lived in a time where it's just you can, can you grow, you can grow, 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 but now we have real constraints. Um, and so when you have those real constraints, you have to look at things like loss and waste reduction because you have to utilize more of that total system. You can't keep expanding. So I, I think we need to get governments really on board with this as a climate issue, as an agriculture issue, but more importantly as a food security issue. And I see no reason why it can't rapidly happen. It's just uh, it needs immediate attention. And those 20% of governments, are you seeing them actually act, or is that also a problem where people have said they're doing it are also not really doing it? No, I, th I think you see real action when you have that government and public and private sector engagement. You've got a lot of companies globally that really want to do this. Um, it's not an issue where the private sector does not want to be involved. It's actually the opposite. It's just so much of the system, especially waste management, as you look at the whole system, the public sector takes on a lot of that responsibility. You can't do it without the public sector. Ana Catalina, I'd love to hear about how the public sector affects your work. I think in a lot of places, 
regulation is the number one barrier to reuse of food. You know, a lot of places have laws in place for good reason to manage food safety and ensure that food that might be, you know, donated from one location to another is still safe to eat, you know, when it arrives at the second location. So how, how do you manage those sorts of things and ensure that, you know, regulation maintains food safety, but also allows for food reuse when that is possible and safe? Teresa, that is one of the works that we are doing. Uh, during the last uh, four years, we have been working with Harvard to understand how the policies are um, contributing to the donation uh, policies in countries. At this day, we have evaluated um, 30 countries across the globe that is giving us the understanding about where we are, what type of policies we are having, how the policies, how the laws are incentivizing, destroying food, for example, because we have, for example, some taxes laws in some countries where the taxes allow the company to reduce their inventories in 3% without any explanation. That means they don't have to pay taxes for that 3% of inventory. They don't have to present what happened with that inventory. That is, at the, at the end, an incentive to the companies to reduce their inventories without a, any explanation and without donate any of the food that they have. Then one of the things that, that we are looking is how, the, how we can create tax incentives in the countries to help the companies, not just the companies when we are talking about manufacturing, we are talking about agriculture farmers too, because we want to incentivize the decision making process around how to increase the donations. But let me say that donation is not the, the only way to reduce food loss and waste. It's one of the key elements to do it. What we are promoting is how we can prevent and reduce food loss and waste. And if the companies or the producers uh, couldn't sell the product that they were trying to sell, the surplus is going to be donated. What we are promoting is how to reduce the amount of food that we are sending to the landfills, the amount of food that we are using to compose, and the amount of food that we are using uh, to feed in animals. And let me say again about food, uh, compose and feeding animals, because I'm not against of that. I'm just believe that it's important to do a big difference when we are producing food for human consumption or when we absolutely need to produce compost and feeding animals. Like we were saying this morning with the video with the movie about the numbers of the food that we are producing to feed animals. At the same time, we have more than 900 million people suffering hunger. And Teresa just was, my people is going to Kill me if I don't say this one, the gender gap. Mm -hmm. We must talk about that. In this moment, according with the last numbers, 10% is the difference between food insecurity in men and food insecurity in women. We need to do something. It's an urgent call around what is happening. The situation after the pandemic is getting worse for the women across the globe. And for all the women that are here and the men that are here, we need to stand up and say, we need to close the gap that is growing and is getting worse. Maybe white women are privileged as me. Mm -hmm. And we have access to these scenarios. But there are amount of food, amount of people, women, that are not accessing to the rights that they deserve. Then we need to talk about the gender gap when we are talking about food insecurity. Thank you so much for bringing that up. I think that's a huge piece, the hidden hunger that we don't often talk about. And a lot of the data we have is not gender disaggregated. So we don't necessarily always know if you're doing a household survey. You're probably hearing from the man who's the household head about what food insecurity is like in that household. So thank you so much for raising that point. Um, I could talk about this forever. This is one of my favorite topics, so find me at the reception. We can chat. Um, but unfortunately, we're out of time for this panel. Thank you so much to the three of you for joining us. I really enjoyed this one. Thank you. Thank you.